Hi, the Mud Broker here. This is the first of three videos I'm going to do on the subject of cast iron. Believe it or not, with a couple of exceptions, everything you see on this wall and down here are antiques. And, again, with a couple of exceptions, none of these cost me more than ten dollars. Hard to believe, I know. But in this first video, I'm going to show you how to identify good cast iron, regardless of the brand name or country of origin, and give you a few tips on where you can find it. In the next video, I'm going to show you how to restore your finds, and in the last one, I'm going to show how I season my pans. I'm going to call them pans, even though most of what you see here are actually skillets, simply because I call them pans. Now, like I just mentioned, all of these are antiques, except for this pan here. That's a lodge that I bought brand new in, I think, 1990 or so. And this pan here is very old. But all the rest of these are really quite old. You might notice a couple of them that look a little out of place, like this rusty little guy up here. Then there's one down here that's kind of sad looking. But most of these I paid very little for. And if you know what to look for and where to look, you'd be surprised at what you can find. I bought this pan right here. I don't know how good that's going to show up. That's what's known as a small logo Griswold pan. I bought this just for this video at a thrift sale last summer and it cost all the ten dollars. You see pans like that on eBay going for forty to sixty dollars. A lot of these pans are brand names. They're marked Wagnerware and there's oh, a fair number of Griswolds floating around here like that. And that's the first thing most people look for because Griswold and Wagner are excellent pans and they're the two biggest names in cast iron. But a lot of these, let me get over here, aren't marked. They just have a number and a size on them. And pans like that, most people will tend to pass by. Kind of in my own light there. And that is where you can really find some fantastic cookware for next to nothing. That green enamel chicken fryer used to belong to my wife's mother. This pan right here and that square griddle there, well rectangular griddle, belonged to my wife. And this Dutch oven here I got from my mother. Other than that, back up again, other than that, all of those pans are ones that I have bought over the years. A little word on hanging cast iron on a wall like that. Most people wouldn't be able to do that because they have sheetrock walls. Years ago, the last time I remodeled my kitchen, I had the sense to put a sheet of three quarter inch plywood behind that section of the wall. So if I want to hang something, all I got to do is poke a screw in and hang it up. Okay, I've got to move my stuff around, set up for the next shot, and then I'll show you the difference between good cast iron and bad. The first thing you have to learn when it comes to finding good cast iron dirt cheap is how to spot bad cast iron. So I have some examples here of good cast iron, bad cast iron, and insanely bad cast iron. The first thing to look at is the texture. I broke the handle off this. This is, this is a fajita pan that I got at Goodwill. You find tons of these things at Goodwill's, St. Vincent de Paul second hand shops because most of them are junk. Anyway, <clears throat> the first thing you want to look at is the texture. This is extremely rough on the front and on the back. And you can even see, hopefully the light in the camera will pick that up good. You see this dark blotchy stuff up in the corner? 
that is slag. That's impurities in the iron that normally would get skimmed off before you tried to pour it into the mold. They didn't even bother with this thing. This hasn't, like I said, this is a very poorly made bit of iron. And if you look, hopefully the camera will pick this up. It has a very sparkly crystalline look to it. You can see little tiny flashes of glittery looking bits in there. That indicates that it's a very poor grade of iron. It has a very large crystalline structure. All metal, well pretty much all metal, crystallizes as it cools from the molten state into a solid. The bigger the crystals, the worse time you're going to have with the iron. Because bad cast iron is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to season. You can see, let me get the angle right there, you can see that somebody tried at some point to actually use this little tiny pan and they tried to season it and the seasoning the oil will just sit on the surface it won't penetrate to any depth it won't it just won't do anything it just sits on the surface this is a good bit better made than this thing but you can see it also has a very grainy texture to it and it has that sparkly look to it that glittery look. Another thing about bad cast iron is it will always be thick and heavy and chunky for its size. This little pan here, turn my scale on, I don't know if that's going to show on the camera, but this little pan here weighs 712 grams. This pan, this is a old way a Wagner Ware pan that I'm going to refinish in my next video is a good bit larger. But even so, it only weighs 666 grams. Oh my god, it's the pan of the beast! Run for your lives! Anyway, this is a little lodge soup pot. And you can see even though it has a little bit more texture to it, it doesn't have that grainy look to it or that flashy sparkly crystalline look. There are a few spots where there's bright spots, but that's just from high spots getting worn and rubbed on. You can tell that this is, even though it's kind of heavy, this is good iron. The reason why bad cast iron is always thick is because iron with a lot of impurities in it doesn't flow into a mold very well. So they have to make the mold bigger in order for it to fill. But heavy cast iron isn't necessarily bad cast iron. This pan weighs 1029 grams and it's the same size as the pan of the beast, but it's good cast iron. This is a perfectly acceptable pan. It has a smooth texture, even though there's a little bit of even though there's a little bit of pitting in it. It has a fairly smooth texture and it doesn't have that nasty grainy crystalline look. <clears throat> so well you can well if you have a thin pan it's almost always going to be good. A thick pan isn't necessarily bad, but a bad pan is almost always going to be thick. Try and keep that in mind. Sometimes you're going to find pans that have a lot of crud on them, a lot of buildup, and it can be kind of hard to tell exactly what the iron is if you aren't terribly experienced at it, but you can see this pan has a very smooth, very glossy interior surface. And another thing to look for is the end of the handle usually doesn't get much if any buildup on it. And this is very smooth, extremely fine grained, and you can tell that this is good iron. This is another pan you're going to be seeing again. So hopefully that will give you a little bit of a primer on good iron and bad and once I set things up again I will show you some other things to look for. 
A couple of other characteristics you need to be aware of in your pursuit of cast iron are cracks and wobble. We'll start off with wobble. If you put a pan on a flat surface and you tap the handle a bit and it wobbles, move this one back, or if it spins real easy, that means the bottom of the pan has a slight warp to it. A pan that doesn't have any warp to it won't wobble and it won't spin. Collectors absolutely hate wobbly pans. But if you're more interested in cooking, it doesn't really make much difference. The pan will still sit fine and dandy on your stove. You might need a touch more oil to completely cover the bottom of the pan, but that's about it. The only time you run into a problem with a wobbly pan is if you have a sealed top, glass top sort of stove. A little wobble will still work fine, but if it has a severe bowl to it, the bottom of the pan won't heat evenly. Wobble actually works to the cook's advantage. If you're someplace where you can haggle over the price, like a flea market or a thrift sale, a wobbly pan is a good reason to talk the price down a bit. And a lot of times, collectors will pass by perfectly nice pans like this. This is a nice little Wagner ware, simply because it has a wobble to it. So, wobble actually kind of works to your advantage. Let me get my camera on the tripod for this next bit. But what doesn't work to your advantage are cracks. You do not want a cracked pan. So, you want to look your pans over very closely before you buy them and see if there are any cracks. This looks like a crack, but it isn't. That's actually just a casting flaw. It doesn't go all the way through the pan. This is a pretty obviously cracked pan. This isn't quite so obvious, except out on the very edge. But the easiest way to tell whether or not a pan is cracked is take it by the end of the handle, flip it over, and give it a little slap. See how that sounds dead? It's the same with this one. It's not quite as bad, because on this one the cracks don't go all the way out to the rim. But compare that to a pan that isn't cracked. That has a nice clear bright ring to it. Even a pan like this, which has a lot of crud on it, will still have a nice clear ring to it. So, when you're looking over a pan, look it over fairly closely and see if there's any cracks and take it and give it a little slap. And that should prevent you from buying a useless broken pan. All right, I'm all set up again. And in this segment, I'm going to show you how to identify some of the pieces of cast iron you're most likely to come across. First, I'm going to show you what's one of my favorite pans. This has everything you want to look for in a cast iron frying pan. It has a dead flat bottom, no wobble, no spin. It's a nice, thin, light pan. Nice, smooth interior surface. It browns just beautifully. Whenever I make hash browns or fried potatoes, this is the pan I use. I got this at a thrift sale for 25 cents. It was unwanted, unloved. Nobody else was interested in it because it was made in Taiwan. The point being, you should always look first at what a pan actually is before you worry too much about a brand name or anything like that. This is a bit of an exception. Ever since cast iron started taking off and getting real popular again, there have been tons and tons and tons of really bad imported cast iron, most of it from China. But it all has that really coarse, gritty, nasty texture to it. They're mostly really thick, heavy, clunky pans. Some of them are even pre-seasoned, but God only knows what they season them with, so 
you're best off to avoid stuff like that if you come across it. Let me move this out of the way and we'll get into this. Now, pans that have a maker's name on them tend to get snapped up pretty quick, especially if they're cheap. Sometimes you're the one who's lucky enough to be there to snap them up, but a lot of times you're going to find pans that are unmarked. What I mean by unmarked is that they don't have a manufacturer's name on them. For instance, this is of course a Griswold round griddle. But what a lot of people don't realize is that this is also a Griswold pan. See it has a slightly italicized 5 and a part number on it. This is what they called their Iron Mountain range of pans. And they have a distinctive shape to the handle. See how it's that kind of long rectangular oblong shape. Both Griswold and Wagnerware made quite a few unmarked pans and pans under different names for sale in things like the Montgomery Ward catalog, Sears catalog, and department stores. So you find a fair amount of pans that are actually big name pans that have no name on them. We'll set this guy aside. These are real nice pans if you come across them. They're just like any other Griswold. Most people, of course, will recognize a Wagner Ware pan. Oh, and something else I should mention. You notice the shape of this pan? Oh, it has kind of steep sides and a real angular bottom where the bottom meets the side. Most of those shaped pans were made before 1930 or so and were made for use on wood stoves. More modern pans tend to have more of a rounded edge where the bottom meets the sides. And this also has what's known as a smoke ring or a heat ring on it. That was to help keep the smoke in a wood stove when you took an eye off and set the pan down in the stove. Right directly over the fire. Anyway, this is a Wagnerware pan, but so is this. They made a lot of these, they call them unmarked Wagners mostly, where it just has a size, six and a half inch skillet and there's a little part number, uh, that's a mold number underneath of it. You see quite a few of these, they're fairly common. This is that little broken pan from earlier. <clears throat> anyway, these are fairly common. They're also very good pans, assuming they're not broken. So if you find one of them, go ahead and grab it. But, a Wagner pan that you want to avoid are Wagner's like these. You'll notice the inside of that has got a really rough kind of nasty texture to it. They're thick, they're heavy. And this bigger one you can see better. Even though they have the Wagner wear name on them, they also say GHC, General Housewares Corporation, made in USA. If a pan says made in USA on it, that means it was made after 1963. That can kind of help you date it if you find something like that. But these were made, the company that owned Griswold and the company that owned Wagnerware merged in the late 1950s. They shut down production of Griswold pans. They kept up production of the uh, unmarked Wagners like I showed you earlier. Those are good pans. But in the 1960s they started making these and they're really not very good. You're best off to just avoid them if you come across them. And they are fairly common, so there you go with that. Now, we'll move on to Lodge. Most people recognize the Lodge name. They're still in business, and they have been since the early 1900s. The modern Lodge, you can find them just about anywhere, Walmart or, you know, pretty much anywhere, really. They're inexpensive. They have a bit of a rough texture to them. Not really rough rough. But it's kind of a pebbly texture. And uh, I'm not a big fan of that. But it is what it is. But most people get this big heavy thing out of the way. You can see it's got that pebbly texture to the inside. Most people don't know 
that this is also a lodge pan. Before 1930, Lodge had their name on the pans in just block letters, but after that, for some reason, they quit putting their name on it and they went to this. They put a notch in the heat ring and a size number on them, and that was it. The older pans from the 30s and 40s have one notch in the heat ring. From the 40s and 50s, they have two notches, and from the 50s on up until they started using that new style logo, they have three notches. These are also pretty common, you see them quite a lot. They have a nice smooth inside, inside surface, and they're a very worthwhile pan. They're a little bit heavier and thicker than Wagner or Griswold, and you'll notice that they have a smaller pour spout on them than you do on Wagner or Griswold pans. That's one of the things you can use to help recognize them. Another common unmarked pan is Birmingham Stove and Range, or BSR. Usually they just have a size number on them. This is a big one, this is the number 12. But sometimes there's a couple of different styles. Sometimes they also have a size number and an actual measurement on them. The thing that you can use to recognize a BSR pan is you see this sharp ridge down the back side of the handle? That ridge runs all the way into the side of the pan. A lot of other pans that have a bit of a ridge on the bottom of the handle will flatten off before they run into the side of the pan. So if it has a ridge all the way through it, it's probably a BSR. Those are also a bit heavier and they have small little pour spouts on them like a lodge does, but they're very good pans. They're also pretty common. You see those quite a bit and if you see one cheap, go ahead and get it. This big guy here is a Chicago Hardware and Foundry. They only tend to have a number, sometimes a number and a letter. It's a fairly big letter, or big number rather, it's about an inch tall. This is that hammered finish. That's what they call that dimpling on it. Pretty much all manufacturers made a hammered finish pan of one sort or another. These aren't real common, you don't see them very often. And this is a heavy brute. It's good iron, but it weighs a ton. It's pretty heavy for its size. Like I said, they're not very common, but they're also a very good pan. What we have here is a white, probably pretty bright under them lights, a white enameled Volrath wear pan. i do this one-handed. Now, Volrath is still in business, but they haven't made cast iron pans since, I don't know, the 1950s maybe. And a lot of their pans don't have the name on them, but they'll have a number, a lot of times with a line on either side of it. And that dog is barking at muck monsters. He's really going to start irritating me pretty soon. Anyway, the thing that really identifies a Volrath pan is if it has a name or a number, it is in line with the handles where most other pans the numbers or names are at right angles to the handle. So if you have something that just has a number that's in line with the handle it's probably a Volrath. I'm also going to include links to a couple of video to a couple of videos and a couple of websites to help identify unmarked cast iron and I'm going to set up one more time, get this stuff out of the way, and then I'll show you a little bit about lids. I'm going to wind up this video with a discussion on lids. Lids are kind of scarce. I almost never see them in secondhand shops, and I've had better luck finding them in flea markets and thrift sales, but even then, I don't see them very often. Fortunately, you don't need a lid for every pan for most usage, and you don't need a lid that fits perfectly either. If a lid is a little too small and sits down inside the pan a bit, as long as it's not right inside your food, that's not a problem. If a lid is a little bit too big, 
as long as it isn't falling right off the edge, you're okay too. Although, if it hangs over the side of the pan a little bit, it might tend to drip condensation on your stove, but that ain't no big deal. The one thing you do need a properly fitted lid for is a Dutch oven. And if you have a Dutch oven without a lid, well, you might have some problems. The thing is, the size numbers among cast iron cookware are not consistent. They're not set to any standard and even among different products from the same manufacturer you oftentimes have a little bit different size. For instance this is a number 8 Griswold skillet and this is a number 8 Griswold Dutch oven. This lid fits perfectly on the Dutch oven but it's a little bit small on the same size number frying pan. To add to the problem, different manufacturers are different sizes as well. This is a number 8 Wagner lid and it doesn't fit very well on that number 8 Griswold. So if you need something that actually fits, the best thing you can do is you know, figure out exactly what it is. If I had the bottom to a number 10 Griswold tight top Dutch oven and was looking for a lid, I would want to find a lid that had the same style of logo. Griswold used different style of logos for different periods. This is called a slant logo. It is kind of italicized. They used this from the early 1900s into the mid 1920s. Look at the patent dates, if it has it on there, and look for a catalog number or a part number. Sometimes what you want is a sequential number. Sometimes it's part A, part B. It kind of depends on what you're doing. Let me show you something kind of neat. This is a number nine favorite Pequot Ware three-legged kettle. that cool. Even cooler is this. This is a number nine Jewett and Root three-legged kettle. This is the oldest cast iron I have. This was made sometime between 1845 and 1870. Paid 15 bucks for it at a thrift sale. This, this number 10 Griswold Dutch oven lid is too big for that number nine favorite wear pot, but it fits perfectly on that Jewett and Root number nine kettle. So go figure. My advice at the end of this video, if you want to get into vintage cast iron cookware or cast iron cookware in general, is first educate yourself a little bit. Go out and look around and see what you can find in second-hand stores. Summer's coming, so there's going to be a lot of thrift sales, yard sales, that sort of thing. Go out and see what you can find. Try and find an example of really, really bad cast iron, like that fajita pan I showed you in the beginning, just so you know what bad cast iron looks like. When you do find something that looks like good cast iron, Remember to buy the pan, not the name. Because it says Griswold on there, it doesn't make it any better, really, than that made in Taiwan frying pan of mine. If it does say Griswold on there and you can buy it cheap, by all means do so because it will be a good pan. Your best bet is to go out and look for, let me move over here, some of the unmarked pans. They're fairly common and usually pretty cheap. Something like that, Vintage Lodge there, or, oh, where's another one here? Or BSR pans. They're very popular, they're good pans, and you're not going to go wrong buying one. And you can usually find them fairly cheap. And like I said before, the BSR and the Vintage Lodge are pretty common to find. 
If you really can't find anything, go ahead and buy something on eBay. After you've done a little bit of research, compare the prices, compare the shipping especially on eBay because you can really get nailed on shipping and it's going to be expensive anyway because cast iron is heavy. If you want to splurge and get yourself a Griswold pan, something like that, that's a number 7 Griswold, is usually going to cost you 60-70 bucks in good shape where the same sized vintage unmarked lodge you can probably get for about 30 bucks. So keep that in mind and go ahead and just be patient, hunt around, keep looking and eventually you can amass quite an impressive amount of cast iron for very little money.